we all have grown up in the modern era, and so we are all subject to its damaging impact. And so one of the reasons that we recommend these great books is that if we read them seriously, take them seriously, there is the possibility that our understanding of man and his possibilities will be expanded and all sorts of things then are made possible. My name is John Fennell. Welcome to the second lecture in the series, A Proper Understanding of K-12 Education, Theory and Practice. The title of this second lecture is A Proper Understanding of Education. There is a level at which the study of education is fundamentally simple. For this preliminary lecture in a vi video series labeled Introduction to Education, I want to dwell on just two principles and to provide illustrations of those principles. Together, study of these two principles will move us well in the direction of a proper understanding of education. Let's construct a useful diagram. When we, talk of it, when we talk of education, we are almost always referring to a particular policy or practice. Now, this policy or practice might be a discipline policy. It might be the content of the curriculum. It might be the way that people are allowed to dress. It might be what we do when someone misbehaves. There are countless matters to which we can and do refer under the heading of educational policy or practice. And so this is our starting point, educational policy or practice. From this, everything will follow. Essential to the two principles we will discuss today is the recognition that education, theoretically and practically, is not autonomous. It arises out of something and in turn gives rise to yet something else. The 20th century British philosopher Bertrand Russell lucidly observed, let me read this to you, we must have some concept of the kind of person we wish to produce before we can have any definite opinion as to the education which we consider best. What Russell is getting at here is if we are to proceed intelligently in the conduct of education, we need to have some idea of what it is we are attempting to accomplish. And logically, there is only one source for this activity, namely our conception of human flourishing, or what it is to be genuinely educated. Note that this conception of human flourishing is one of two central components of something broader, namely our, our understanding of human nature. So what is the other central component? The answer is our conception of what man is. So we have a formula which, I promise, we will connect to the starting point already established. And here is the formula. What man is plus what he ought to be, that is to say human flourishing, together equal our conception of human nature. But when we thoughtfully execute educational strategies, we also always have a social and political end in mind. With more or less clarity and self-awareness, when we educate, we envision a consequence for the surrounding community whether that community be family, tribe, city, or nation. Now there is an additional fascinating dimension to this relationship. It is reciprocal. We expect education to affect the social and political world, but we also recognize the legitimacy of the social and political world employing education to advance its purposes. And so we have a third display, which again I promise to connect with the other, the other uh, statements. And that third display is on the board as well. Educational policy or practice is connected to social or political ideal. But notice that we have a two-way arrow here. And that two-way arrow is the reciprocity that I just mentioned a minute ago. In other words, to the degree we think clearly and comprehensively about education, we envision significant social and political consequences. And similarly, anyone with a vision for the social or political world recognizes that progress in the favored direction necessarily depends upon successful implementation and execution of educational strategies. We have uh, turned the board over in order to capture all of this together. 
And putting all this together provides the framework of what is to, what is to follow today. If we take everything we've said so far, we have this. The conception of human nature gives rise to educational policy or practice, which in turn has a reciprocal relationship with social or political ideal. Remember that conception of human nature itself has two aspects, what man is as well as what we think he ought to be, or human flourishing. And notice as well the two-way arrow, that's the reciprocity. This is going to be extremely important as we move on. Let us now turn to illustrations of these principles, which is the second part of my presentation today. All the serious and wise minds in history, insofar as they thought comprehensively, have had plenty to say about these matters. We are, in other words, faced with an embarrassment of riches. We will therefore need to be quite selective as well as brief. Some commentators are especially insightful, and so I will concentrate on just a handful of the figures who we could look at. Let us begin with the connection between education and our conception of human flourishing. What is it to be a truly educated human being? There is a wide range of responses to this question, and frequently these responses are incompatible. As we survey a variety of conceptions of what constitutes our highest possibilities, let us also keep an eye on the underlying understanding of the raw material, that is to say, on what human beings in fact are. And in our survey here of, uh, of various figures in our illustrations, let us begin with Plato. Plato's Republic is widely understood as one of the three most thoughtful and significant treatises ever written on education. Now there can be, and is, considerable controversy regarding the ranking of the other two. But it is clear that when it comes to examination of the issues that concern us today, there is no more fruitful starting point than this book. We will draw from its treasures and then enrich, further enrich the, the account by referring to Plato's portrayal of the death of Socrates in the dialogues titled Credo and Phaedo. In the Republic, Plato is concerned with the condition of the soul. This is the English word, soul is the English word that translates the Greek term psyche. This, of course, is not the Christian conception of the soul which emerged over subsequent centuries. The Republic is a fictionalized account of conversations between actual persons who talked to one another in Athens in the years preceding the close of the 5th century BC. Scholars speculate that the conversations upon which the dialogue is based took place around 411 BC. A central concern of the educational program outlined in the Republic is to establish balance and harmony in one's soul. The reason this is a problem is that the soul consists of three components, each of which is prone to extremism. Only when the three elements work together for a common end can we say that the individual is healthy. In saying this, Plato, through the speech of Socrates, gives us our first conception of human flourishing. The three parts of the soul are the appetitive, the spirited, and the rational. Plato would have the rational component rule, but we should notice that for Plato, if any of the three were to act entirely on its own, any of the three aspects of the soul were to act entirely on its own, the envisioned balance and harmony would be absent. Let us hear from Plato himself as he speaks of the just and unjust soul. And I'm reading from the Republic, and this is the translation by Alan Bloom, which we at Hillsdale highly recommend. And here we have in the midst of the dialogue, in actually uh, book two, we have the, these words from uh, Socrates. But in truth, justice was something of this sort. However, not with respect to a man's mind in his external business, but with respect to that is within, that to what is within, with respect to what truly concerns him and his own. He doesn't let each part in him mind other people's business or the three classes in the soul meddle with each other, but really sets his own house in good order and rules himself. He arranges himself, becomes his own friend, and harmonizes the three parts. And then later he says, he believes and names a just and fine action, one that preserves and helps to produce this condition and wisdom, the knowledge that supervises this action, while he believes and names an unjust action, one that undoes this condition. 
Later he says, I suppose injustice must be considered. And then his interlocutor says plainly, Socrates has a number of yes men in the dialogue, mustn't it in its turn be a certain faction among th those three, this is injustice, a meddling, interference, and rebellion of a part of the soul against the whole. The purpose of the rebellious part is to rule in the soul, although, the, although this is not proper. So what we see here in these excerpts from the dialogue is that justice consists of the working together of the three parts of the soul in harmony towards a, a, an end in common. And unjust, an unjust soul is when one, of the, one or more of the components is acting on its own without regard for the higher good. Now, for Plato, there's an education that fits each of the elements of the soul. And that's, that's part of what makes the book such a long and interesting uh, uh, read, because there's much to be said about these matters. The Republic, especially in the early books, presents what some people find to be a stupefying account of details pertaining to the proper rearing of the young. The reason people are stupefied or overwhelmed by all these details is that we most of us have not thought about how it is that we become the person we are. Plato emphasizes that each and every influence is important. Especially significant, says Plato, is what takes place in the earliest years when we are most impressionable. So once again, let me read from the dialogue. Don't you know that the beginning is the most important part of every work and that this is especially so with anything young and tender? For at that stage, it's most plastic, and with each thing assimilates itself to the model whose stamp anyone wishes to give to it. And this is not news to most parents, though it seems to be news to many educators. He goes on to say, first, as it seems, we must supervise the makers of tales, and if they make a fine tale, it must be approved, but if it's not, it must be rejected. We'll persuade nurses and mothers to tell the approved tales to their children and to shape their souls with tails more than their bodies with hands. Most of those they now tell must be thrown out. Now in the second uh, quotation, I've gone a bit beyond the recognition of the importance of the early years to point out one of the consequences that uh, Plato emphasizes, and that is if the early years are so important, then we need to be very careful what the young hear. We have to, be, uh, we have to control those things. A little bit further he says, this is Socrates speaking in the dialogue, a young thing can't judge what is hidden sense and what is not. But what he takes into his opinions at that age has a tendency to become hard to eradicate and unchangeable. Perhaps it's for this reason that we must do everything to ensure that what they hear first with respect to virtue be the finest told tales for them to hear. So the early years are the most important because we are malleable, we are impressionable, and these influences have an impact that stays with us forever. And I would point out something very important. I won't have time today to dwell on this, but this is very important, and I want to leave it with you. This is the time, these early years, are the, this is the time when we are most likely to learn what we are unaware that we know. Let me say that again. This is the time when we are most likely to learn what we are unaware that we know. And part of what Plato says, part of what makes all of these great writers members of a fraternity, is that they are aware that the things that we are unaware of are the most important things. They do, in fact, govern our thought and action later in life. The Republic is a masterwork regarding the shaping of character. It can be read as a detailed manual pertaining to the process by which each of us becomes one sort of person rather than another. Given the end in view, and remember for Plato, the end in view is a balanced soul, each of the constituent elements must undergo a sort of education. The appetites need to be tempered and directed. directed. The rational component must be cultivated. And the spirit, this is the third part of the soul for Plato, the spirit, which the Greeks called thumos, which is sort of like what we would call emotion, must be shaped such that it will assist the rational component in a never-ending battle with the appetites. Success in this endeavor depends upon doing the right things at the right time in the right order. 
For example, we do not appeal to the reason of a young person, of a child, because that they're not yet capable of reasoning. But there is something we can do in the earliest years. We can appeal to a kind of desire in the young and through this action set the stage for the rule of reason later. And this is what Plato recommends. In addition, Plato would have us during childhood and during youth seize every opportunity to strengthen thumos and harness appetite. There is constant vigilance in the Republic regarding what children hear and see and how they spend their time. No influence is trivial. If in fact we care about the young, and if we care about the people whose character will determine the contours of the world in which we and our progeny will live, we must, Plato says, be constantly on alert. In his description of education, Plato is outlining an advanced art, one that can be performed well, performed poorly, or not performed at all. Were he to visit, visit us today, he would surely be aghast at the degree to which human rearing has been left a chance are only somewhat less egregious the manner in which uh, human rearing is a product of misunderstanding. To close our brief, brief, uh, brief treatment of Plato, let me direct you to his account of the end of Socrates. As most of you know, Socrates has been condemned to death by the city of Athens. After his condemnation, he's sitting in prison and he's waiting for the moment when he must drink the poison, the hemlock. His friend Credo, an old friend, arrives to tell Socrates that he, Credo, has bribed the guard and he has arranged for Socrates to escape prison and avoid execution by fleeing the city of Athens. Socrates refuses Credo's uh, suggestion. He says this, was, this would insult the city and that he, Socrates, owes so much to Athens that if he were to flee, he would, he would show a lack of appreciation. In other words, Socrates would demonstrate bad character. Socrates asked Credo, what? Would you have me violate the most sacred laws from a miserable desire of a little more life? Now naturally, the appetitive component of, Socr of Socrates' soul is crying out for continued survival. But reason rules, overrules, it rules and overrules appetite and its capacity to rule is in part attributable to the support of properly trained emotion. So Socrates calmly remains and accepts his fate. And this leads to one of the most moving scenes in all of literature, and this is captured at the end of the dialogue called the Phaedo. And I have several passages I want to read, though I probably should not read them all. The rich, though, you just uh, you want to read every bit of it. But let me uh, capture the high point here. Pay attention here to uh, Socrates' character. Now, this is being narrated by another person, and he's saying, By this time it was near to sunset, for he, Socrates, had spent a long time in the inner room. So he came and sat with us after his bath and did not talk much more. And now the agent of the prison authorities had arrived and stepping up to him said, Socrates, I shan't have my usual ground for complaint in your case. Many people get angry and abusive when I instruct them at the behest of the authorities to drink the poison. Imagine that. People get unhappy about that. But I have, but I have always known you while you have been here for the most generous, the best tempered, and the finest man of any that have entered this place. And in particular, I feel sure now that you are not angry with me but with those whom you know to be responsible for this. Well, you know what I have come to tell you, so now goodbye and try to bear as best you may what must be borne. And as he said this, he burst into tears. This is the guard at the prison. And turned to leave us. Socrates looked up at him and said, Goodbye to you. I will do as you say. And then to us, he says, What a delightful person. All these weeks he has been coming to see me and talking with me now and then, like the excellent fellow he is. And now see how generously he weeps for me. Well, come now, Credo, let us do his bidding. If the draft had been prepared, will someone please bring it to me? If not, tell the man to prepare it. And then one more. 
At this, Credo nodded to his slave who stood close by, whereupon the latter went out and after a considerable time came back with the man who was to administer the poison, which he was carrying in a cup ready to drink. On seeing this, Socrates exclaimed, All right, good sir, you know about this business. What must I do? Simply drink it, he replied, and then walk around till you have a feeling of heaviness in your legs. Then lie down and it will act of itself. And as he spoke, he offered Socrates the cup and I tell you, he took it quite calmly without a tremor or any change of complexion or expression. He just fixed the man with his well-known glare and asked, what do you say to using the drink for our libation? Or is that not allowed? The man replied, we only mix what we judge to be the right dose, Socrates. I see, he rejoined. Well, at all events, it is allowed to pray to the gods, as indeed we must, for a happy journey to our new dwelling place. And that is my prayer, so may it be. With these words, he put the cup to his lips and drained it with no difficulty or taste, distaste whatever. Well, that's not the end. There's actually another page of this. But I hope that you notice in this account the calmness of Socrates, the balance and harmony of the soul, his capacity to overcome the emotions and the appetites. And so he is the very personification of the just soul that has been sought after and described in the Republic. Now this account of human excellence is paralleled only by a scene in Palestine that takes place some four centuries later. For a different account of human flourishing and what it is to be truly a truly educated human being, let us now turn to St. Augustine. The depth and consistency of his vision is breathtaking. For Augustine, success in education consists in arriving at an understanding. It is a matter of seeing. In achieving this proper perspective, what we are coincides with what we ought to be. The saint shows, shows us what he means through his confessions. Looking back, he sees the sense of it all. This, the Confessions is a personal account of his life, and he's looking back now. And in retrospect, for example, he says of an episode from his youth, My God, how I burned, how I burned with longing to leave earthly things and fly back to you. I did not know what you were doing with me. Now notice that St. Augustine is always in a dialogue with God. Now this is something that didn't happen until well into his adult life, but once he got there, everything makes sense. He looks back and it all fits together, and he's always talking with God about that. So early in his life he didn't understand, but now he does understand. And in this remarkable book, The Confessions, he, establish, he establishes that what happened to him can happen to us all. And what happened to him is that he came to realize that God is at the center though he, Augustine, being human all too human, failed to grasp this for many, many long years. Now, what does it mean to see that God is at the center? When it comes to education, the implication of this is astounding. Speaking from the perspective of the teacher, St. Augustine tells us in yet another book called On the Teacher, and I'm going to read from that book, it is not I who teach him. It is not I, the teacher, who teach the teaches the student. For he is being taught not by my words, but by the realities themselves made manifest to him by the enlightening action of God within. So on Augustine's account, the teacher does not teach. Now how can this possibly be? The answer is that while the teacher can prompt a student to discover, discovery or insight is itself the gift of Christ. There is one and only one source of illumination. Everything that occurs is an unfolding of the divine. This is part of the insight that comes with human flourishing for, for St. Augustine. The human being is a creature capable of understanding these facts and living in light of them. When one succeeds in doing so, he achieves human flourishing. So for St. Augustine, human flourishing are that which we ought to be, human nature at its, at its apotheosis, we might say, at that point, every moment is infused. God is at the center. Christ is with us at every moment. Now, arriving at this perspective, which is the measure of human flourishing for St. Augustine, arriving at this perspective is a struggle. 
And it's a struggle in large measure because, as Plato pointed out, human beings are so easily seduced by lower things. Education, then, for St. Augustine, is the name we give to the process in which we are put aright. In the case of St. Augustine, this didn't happen until well into adult life and only after considerable painful experience. But he would have us understand that a more wholesome rearing might bring us more quickly to our proper destiny. Such rearing would, for example, develop an attitude of faith and humility, and it would make real in our lives, as a constant presence, the possibility of divine grace. It would cultivate in the individual the conviction that, quote, I am nothing without him, unquote. That comes from the confessions. But I would point out that a person in a condition of human flourishing for St. Augustine would no longer say, I am nothing without him, meaning God, because he's now speaking with God, he would now say, I am nothing without you. Now, whatever differences exist between the perspectives of Athens and those of J Jerusalem on the question of human flourishing, and by the way, these differences are important and quite stark at times, whatever differences exist between Athens and Jerusalem on this matter pale when the ancient understanding is contrasted with what we might, what we might call the modern understanding. And so I want to take a few minutes now and talk about modernity, or a modern perspective on human flourishing. And in doing so, I want to point to two uh, figures, very prominent figures from the 20th century, two figures who at Hillsdale are somewhat uh, infamous, namely Sigmund Freud and John Dewey. Both of these figures possessed a bold and aggressive conception of education. And as we will see, this understanding of education, despite deep disagreements between Freud and Dewey regarding human nature, this understanding of education that I call the modern position follows from a naturalistic conception of man that places both Dewey and Freud in a world far distant from Plato and St. Augustine. Now I just used the term naturalistic and so I should define the term. Naturalistic is the adjective that corresponds to the noun naturalism. And by the term naturalism, I want to borrow from a contemporary of ours, John Lennox, a professor at uh, Oxford, mathematics professor. Let me borrow from something he has written. This is a definition of naturalism that he offers us. There is nothing but nature. It is a closed system of cause and effect. There is no realm of the transcendent or supernatural. There is no outside. That's John Lennox commenting on the meaning of naturalism. Now this definition of naturalism demonstrates the alliance of the two ancient alternatives, Jerusalem and Athens, or in our case, Plato and St. Augustine, and their common opposition to modernity. Both Jerusalem and Athens recognize something higher that's not naturalistic, subservience to which completes us as human beings and defines human excellence. So there's that fundamental congruence between the two ancient positions that puts them in common in opposition to the modern position. So the, uh, the two ancient positions disagree on what it is that completes us, but they agree quite straightforwardly that there is something beyond the naturalistic that is necessary for us to be truly human. Now, like Plato and St. Augustine, Freud conceives of man as comprised of warring elements. At the deepest level, each of us is an id, a term he coined. And the id, in short, is an identity-less urge for the satisfaction of, pri of primitive urges and drives. Under normal circumstances, we also possess what he calls a superego. We might call that our conscience. And this is the internalization of society's prohibitions on the satisfaction of those very urges that the id wants to satisfy. So the id and the superego for Freud are locked in violent combat, and the ego, we might call it poor ego, is responsible for charting a safe course between the combatants. And this conflict, says Freud, is never-ending. Whatever compromises that are achieved are temporary, and pain is permanent. So this is not a pretty picture that Freud offers us of human nature. And unlike the ancient predecessors, for Freud, there's no possibility of a spiritual resolution of the conflict. This is because Freud, under the influence of Darwinism and other powerful currents of the 19th century, embraced a materialistic form of naturalism. 
or to say it somewhat differently, for Freud, a human being, like everything else in the universe, is fundamentally continuous with the material world that is captured by the categories of physics and chemistry. Now, Freud understood that during his lifetime, science had not yet arrived at a comprehensive account of man. So Freud believed that he was forced to come up with a stopgap measure, something that, that will tide us over until science has these breakthroughs where man can be dealt with purely on a materialistic basis. And this stopgap measure that Freud developed is called psychoanalytic theory. Now, under this theory, we have the infamous division I've already uh, mentioned. For Freud, under this theory, man consists of ego, id, and superego. And these categories become the foundation for a fascinating, if perhaps somewhat fantastic, intellectual construction. What I want to highlight here is that for Freud, there is human flourishing. But because his conception of human nature and human possibilities is so different from what we saw in St. Augustine and Plato, Freud's understanding of human flourishing is going to be nothing like what we saw in the earlier figures. Under the Freudian portrayal, happiness, other than for rare fleeting moments, happiness is impossible. This is because a human being unavoidably yearns for greater satisfaction of fundamental drives and instincts than the world can provide. Let me read from Freud's very, very uh, famous and important book, Civilization and Its Discontents. These are Freud's words. What decides the purpose of life is simply the program of the pleasure principle. This principle dominates the operation of the mental apparatus from the start. There can be no doubt about its efficacy, and yet its program is at loggerheads with the whole world. There is no possibility at all of its being carried through. All the regulations of the universe run counter to it. One feels inclined to say that the intention that man should be happy is not included in the plan of creation. And the word creation is in quotation marks because Freud is an atheist and doesn't believe in creation at all. But he wants to be dramatic. I think he achieved that. And wants to point out that happiness is not in the cards for human beings because of the nature of man and the nature of the world. Now, what is possible for Freud is to learn to accept substitute satisfactions at least some of the time for these drives and instincts that define our id or our fundamental nature. A proper education for Freud can never eliminate frustration and unhappiness, and we're all destined to be neurotic. But with intelligent and skillful rearing, a human being can live a useful and productive life and avoid disabling mental illness. For Freud, there are two measures of such a life, and they are the capacity to work and the capacity to love. Doesn't mean we'll be happy, but you can get out of bed in the morning and go, go, to, go to your job. And the capacity to love is a euphemism for Freud for the ability and the willingness to raise children and keep the species viable. For Freud, there is no escape from scarcity, and there's no, pr no prospect of fulfillment in a world after this world. But in this vision that Freud has, there is room for sacrifice and nobility. There is a kind of human excellence that is available, for certain people at least. But this whole picture offered by Freud, this picture of human fruition that defines what education can and should do, it's a picture that is lonely and sober. And it has strong images of disappointment and gritted teeth. Our second representative moder of modernity and naturalism is John Dewey, about whom most of you have no doubt heard. In our next lecture, when we examine the impact of progressivism on, in education, Dewey's ideas will serve at the f as the focus. Today, I will restrict myself simply to his conception of human flourishing and also to a sketch of how, for him, education is responsible for making that flourishing possible. First, let me point out that for Dewey, there are three aspects to human nature, instinct, habit, and intelligence. In sharp contrast to Freud, and in quite self-conscious opposition to Plato and St. Augustine, Dewey denies that instinct has sufficient definition or influence to control or even largely govern human life. 
Let me read from one of uh, Dewey's prominent works, Human Nature and Conduct. These are Dewey's words. In the case of the young, it is patent that impulses are highly flexible starting points for activities which are diversified according to the ways they are used. Any impulse may become organized into almost any disposition according to the way it interacts with surroundings. This depends upon the outlets and inhibitions supplied by the social environment. So in the place of a, of a determinism such as we find in Freud, and that determinism is tied in Freud to the id, for example, in the place of such a determinism, Dewey paints a picture of man as a creature that is for all intents and purposes malleable. What we, will be, what we will become is very much up in the air, says Dewey, or to say it differently, for Dewey, man is in the making and man is the maker. This may ring a bell for many of you. The vehicle for creating a better human being for Dewey, and through creating a better human being, creating a better world, is establishment of good habits. So habit formation is a major function of early education. Habits, in turn, need to be modified in accordance with changes in what Dewey calls environing conditions. In other words, we have to modify our habits in light of changes in the environment. Now, which habits are to be retained and reinforced and which are to be modified or eradicated altogether? This question is to be decided by the third component of our nature, namely intelligence. This faculty, intelligence, reveals to us the consequences of adhering to the practices, beliefs, principles, and convictions of the past. And if those consequences are deemed by intelligence to be no longer appropriate, it has the further responsibility to formulate new ideas and then following action on the basis of the new ideas to evaluate their impact. This for Dewey is a never-ending natural process that defines the human version of the Darwinian drama of an organism struggling for survival in an ever-changing, unpredictable, and challenging world. So we are to modify what we have believed in the past in light of changing circumstances. And if we fail to do so properly, then our survival is in jeopardy. It is important to note that perhaps the primary habit to be developed under Dewey's scheme is attentiveness to changing conditions married to a propensity to adjust as needed. Such adjustment is facilitated by development of the habit of acting intelligently. This is a thoroughly humanistic understanding of man and human possibilities. And by humanistic, I mean to say that man is solely responsible for what happens to man. And we can't count on anything beyond man to be here to assist us in any way. Given the plasticity of the human being, the emphasis predictably falls upon surrounding circumstances. Here we have the reason for Dewey's unparalleled emphasis on education. This is because education, properly conceived, is for Dewey the deliberate process by which human beings take responsibility for their future. In principle, everything we currently do and believe is subject to review. We possess ideal ends and views, but these ends and view are subject to ongoing revision and we act under their authority after they are revised, but they are always, in principle, subject for further revision. For Dewey, the primary end in view is that of an informed and responsible human being, or many human beings, cooperating to bend the world in the direction of their fruition. Remember, man is responsible for his own fate. Men can act in the manner envisioned by Dewey only if they possess suitable skills, insight, and propensities. In short, suitable human behavior in the future depends upon having earlier appropriate experience, and it is the central purpose of education to provide such appropriate experience. So everything you have heard about Dewey's progressive education, and many of you have heard lots about it, everything you've heard about it is tied to this principle. We must, through education, provide the appropriate experience, Dewey says, such that the young will act appropriately when they're older. We'll look at that much more clearly and in much more detail in the next lecture. As our final figure in this rapid survey, let us now look at C.S. Lewis as he speaks to us in the short yet monumental book, The Abolition of Man. Now, 
Lewis offers a rehabilitation of the ancient perspective that we saw both in St. Augustine and in Plato. And he assures us that we need not acquiesce to the powerful forces of materialism and naturalism. Everything in Lewis's book follows from his definition of man, a matter, quite curiously, that's only touched upon in passing in this book. In fact, you have to be a miner with a pickaxe to actually find this, and it took me oh, about 15 readings of the book to actually notice it. Let me read the two passages in The Abolition of Man where just in passing he defines what man is. First, in explicating the heart of the educational problem, that's his phrase, the educational problem, he states that, quote, the task is to train in the pupil those responses which are in themselves appropriate, whether anyone is making them or not, and in making which the very nature of man consists. See, there we have the definition of man for, for, for Lewis. Responding appropriately in the making and uh, in, in, in making which the very nature of man consists. The second place in the uh, abolition of man reads as follows. In referring to the eternal and unchanging natural moral law, which he calls the, the Tao, he states, quote, in the Tao itself, we find the concrete reality in which to participate is to be truly human, unquote. So when Lewis talks about the abolition of man, what he's pointing to with quite a bit of alarm is the abolition of that creature who is able and willing to respond appropriately to what is eternal and unchanging. For Lewis, education properly understood consists of preserving in future generations that very capacity and willingness. The capacity and willingness to live in light of principle are the good. The book, Abolition of Man, opens up with a warning that there's a sort of education growing in influence which achieves precisely the opposite. This corrupting activity debunks the ideal, makes fun of it, and endeavors to reduce any appeal to principle to naturalistic priorities and objectives. To the degree that this impulse succeeds, the human flourishing that was envisioned by Plato and St. Augustine becomes illusory. Now Dewey, to go back to him for a moment, in his theory of education certainly prescribes an important, places, an important place for principle and ideal. But within Dewey's vision, it is impossible for principle or ideal to attain an eternal and unchanging authority. And it's, it's precisely a principle or ideal with eternal and unchanging authority that we must have for Lewis because it's allegiance to that which for him is a necessary condition for us to flourish as human beings. So the very necessary condition for Lewis's human flourishing is by definition excluded in the modern theories as we see them represented in Dewey and Freud. For, for Lewis, down the path offered by, De offered by Dewey lies the abolition of man. The purpose of education for Lewis, for Lewis is to defeat this outcome by continuing to develop in the young not only the possibility of recognizing the higher things, but also the ability to understand that genuine human flourishing consists in living and perhaps dying in service to them, in service to those principles and ideals. Up to now, we have been dwelling on conceptions of human flourishing with some attention being paid to underlying assertions regarding the funda fundamental nature of man. But you perhaps recall our governing diagram, which is on the board here still. And you might wonder, what has happened to the second relationship? I've been talking extensively about this, how conceptions of human nature give rise to educational policy or practice, but I seem to have ignored this relationship over here. So what about this second relationship? Well, you're correct. We haven't talked about it much. To balance our picture, we need to say something about this other important matter. The remaining time permits just a few words. But we will have ample opportunity to expand these comments in the next lecture, where we will concentrate on the progressive approach to education. For our immediate purposes, I direct your attention once again to Plato. Plato's Republic is accurately viewed as one of the principal texts on politics. 
but Plato would be the first to admit that anything of consequence in the political realm depends on the proper preparation of human beings. To accomplish a political X, it is first necessary to achieve an educational Y. Now here, in my reference to Plato, we are beginning with a political or social vision and then working back to the implications for education. That's one way on the arrow. But the formula works in the other direction as well. That's why we have the two-way arrow. Given the understanding of human flourishing that inspires our educational vision, there are inescapable consequences for the social and political order. Socrates refused to abandon the city that condemned him to death because he recognized the debt he owed Athens for being permitted to live under its rare institutions. He understood that the good life required a particular social and political setting and that Athens, for all its shortcomings, provided such a setting. Conversely, if we are deeply animated by a conception of human flourishing and the educational program that makes it possible, we will be dissatisfied with a social or political order that stands in their way and will be inclined to support one that promises their success. Ideas can be dangerous. If we see what it is to be genuinely human, we'll, we will be impatient with whatever obstructs that end. And here I submit is a major reason for the dramatic growth in homeschooling. But that is a topic for another day. Thank you.